Welcome back to our Answering the Tough Questions with Reverend Arlene Beecher and myself, Pastor Adam Miller. I'd like to welcome you for what will be, at the moment at least, I don't know how Arlene feels about it, but our last one for now uh, for our Answering the Tough Questions, How Do I Share My Faith with Others in Conversation? Uh, just uh, before we open it up to our conversation around this, uh, I just want to encourage you and welcome you. Uh, if you are following along with these, if you have prayer concerns or you have questions or tough questions of your own that you're struggling with, uh, comment on them. Send me a private message or email. I'd love to be able to have a conversation with you about them. Uh, also, I'd like to encourage you to join us for Sunday mornings for worship. We're online 9 a.m. on Facebook Live, uh, so you can definitely catch us at Catawissa Parish, uh, which is Culp and Roy Creek Valley United Methodist Churches. Depending on what all is going on in our COVID uh, world at the moment. We're also generally open for worship on Sunday mornings as well in person. That's 9 a.m. at CULP and 10.30 a.m. at RCV. Uh, please check uh, Facebook page if there are any changes to that as it comes up. So, okay, all that out of the way. Uh, welcome back for our last one. How do I share my faith with others in conversation? Uh, I think we're ending on a really good, uh, less um, less deep, maybe I'll put it that way, uh, note for, for this series. Or maybe more deep, depending or on maybe. how we approach it. <laughs> maybe, maybe. <laughs> I think this is a question that, um, that people really do wrestle with, you know, um, people of faith. How do I let other people know about, um, you know, Jesus Christ? You know, um, it's not, it's not an easy question. It doesn't, I don't no. think it has an easy answer either. Yeah. Uh, I, I think it's something though, that as, as followers of Christ, at one time or another, we're going to struggle or wrestle with this question of how do I do it without looking ridiculous? Um, because we get so built up in our mind how we think it's going to be uh, that we overthink it sometimes to a place where um, we've inserted too many what ifs uh, into the equation. Um, but I also think from right from a pastor perspective, this is definitely something that's urged always uh, to be sharing our faith uh, in conversation with others, um, not to beat anyone over the head with the Bible, but to uh, but to, to be relational in the ways that we share our faith with those around us, whether it be a family member or a neighbor or a cashier at the grocery store, whatever it might be. Um, I think it's, um, we did a series here at Catalyst Parish a few years ago, and one of the uh, ideas, main ideas behind it and sharing faith with others is uh, you see those pictures, especially you'll see them on social media of a white van etched on it, uh, free candy. Um, no one wants to go to the white van for free candy. We don't know uh, the white van. We don't know who's driving it. We have no connection with it before. Um, but if a, a close uh, friend and confidant comes to us and offers us free candy, I doubt they have the phrase out of their mouth before we're already diving into the free candy. Uh, it just all is on that relational part of it uh, for me. And that's where we took that series of, uh, you know, going up to someone and telling them you need Jesus may not go over so well. Um, but if we have a, a more personal connection with them and have done that work first, uh, I think it goes a lot better. Uh, still can be hiccups. I agree. I mean, I think there's a lot of legwork that has to happen before we offer um, our faith life in conversation. I think yes. some other things need to happen before we introduce Jesus into the conversation with people that um, maybe don't see Jesus in us. You know, maybe they need to experience um, what we experience in our faith walk um, or see it in us is what I'm saying. Uh, one of my favorite quotes about evangelism comes from Francis of Assisi. He said, preach the gospel at all times and as necessary, use words. Use words, yes. If necessary, yes. use words. So how do we preach the gospel to others without using words? How do we show Christ to others um, to make them comfortable enough so that we can start to talk about Christ? I think, um, I think that relational evangelism is what's so necessary. Bill Hybels wrote a book uh, several years ago called um, Just Walk Across the Room. Um, and, you know, in that it's like you make friends first, you build up the relationship and then there'll be opportunities to insert, um, you know, the words of Jesus, you know, or, or scripture. Um, too many, like you said, too many of us have a preconceived notion of what it means to share that gospel. 
You know, like I need to carry my Bible around and I need to open it to a certain page and start preaching to folks that will turn people off even faster than, you know, anything, you know, that would turn me <laughs> off. <laughs> yeah. it would. Yeah. So, you know, that you need to have that relationship and then there's opportunities to say, you know, I've been praying for you, um, you know, and then people might look at you a little funny, but you know, then you have an understanding that that person has a prayer life. So what does that mean to have a prayer life? What does it mean that you're praying for me? Um, why do you do what you do? Why are you so happy? Why are you always optimistic? Um, that gives us an opportunity to say, well, because, you know, I've, I follow, I'm a disciple of Jesus. You know, I want to, I want to be more Christ-like. Um, but I think until you have that relationship, those words fall on deaf ears. Yes. I think that, um, again, I know we've had this conversation and tough questions before, but genuine, um, it's got to come from a really genuine place. Um, when we know a person, we, when we know more than just their first name about them, and we spend time in conversations about the weather to family or, or whatever it might be, uh, it allows us to know each other better and to come from a more genuine place. And I think, um, and regardless of what we're talking about, but especially the gospel message, um, it needs to come from that genuine place. It needs to have those opportunities, right? I just preached on Woman of the Well this last Sunday. And, you know, before Jesus really got into the nitty gritty about living water, and go ahead and read that in John 4 if you haven't. Uh, but, you know, first he started to establish a relationship with the woman. Um, they had conversations about her history and his history and who they were and their identities. Um, it is, it's, it's so much more relational than just going and saying, Bob, uh, be a Christian kind of thing. <laughs> well, and I think about Jesus' call to the disciples, um, especially in John, um, when, you know, he says to the first disciples, come and see. He doesn't start preaching to them. He says, come and see. Um, you know, when then when those disciples come to the next two disciples, you know, they invite them to come and see. They don't start preaching right away. They don't start, you know. Um, yes, they think they found the Messiah, but come and see, come and make your, you know, make your own decisions, come and see what I see. Um, and, and the other piece of that, I believe, is when Jesus, when John's disciples, when John was in prison and John's disciples come to Jesus, you know, to see if he truly is the Messiah, are you really, you know, who people are saying you are? Um, he says, what do you see? You know, uh, the sick are healed, you know, the, um, the, the lame walk, you know, um, what do you see? Um, it's not, he doesn't start saying, of course, I'm the Messiah. You know, um, he doesn't start out with that kind of um, the, the strict, uh, like, format that you might want to hear. He says, look around, see what I do, you know, and then you make your decision. Am I the Messiah? You know, so I think, you know, if we wanted to start a conversation with somebody, we should say, you know, come and see what I know about Jesus. Come to worship. But even we don't, we don't invite people to worship. We're not good at that. But even if we do and somebody shows up, we're not always hospitable to that person, you know, and so what they see, it will turn them off too. You know, so if you invite somebody to come and see, it better be a loving thing that they see. <laughs> yeah, and, and interestingly, more and more, the trend seems to be now COVID obviously throws a wrench into all right. that, but um what we commonly uh, saw, especially before the pandemic, and I think we're even seeing it during the pandemic, is small groups are a better way for folks to connect with the church. Right. Um, Build you know, those relationships. I, yeah, exactly. You know, it could be youth group with kids, or it could be you know uh, small groups for parents. Whatever it is, uh, less pressure, uh, more intimate setting where you're able to know each other a little bit more. Um, yeah, we're not tied into the ritual or tradition of of worship necessarily in, in small groups. Some people call that, you know, coming to um, coming to Christ or coming to the worship at the church through the back door. Yes. You know, through through a small group, through a study group, through some event at the church, through the preschool program. You know, um, they make a connection with something that is church, you know, is of Christ. And um, then they might want to come and see more, you know, but they've made those relationships uh, not so much in, you know, a Sunday morning worship. But as they get to know individuals who follow Christ. Right. Um, I, I'm going to butcher his last name, but uh, Kerry Ninewolf, I'm going to say his name is. He's out of Canada. He's a pastor, yes. second career. Um, he has some interesting um, leadership insight for, especially in, in church leadership. 
And one of the things that he's been talking about since the pandemic is the back door of online worship has become a front door right. uh, for folks, uh, which is really interesting. Uh, but it connects folks within their own homes. They don't have to dress to make sure they match anyone else. Um, they can do it in the comfort of their own house. On it. They can sit on the couch and do it. Um, There's lower expectations. Right. You know, we recorded our um our Easter um, sunrise service ahead of time for last year because COVID was just uh, uh, getting started and everything. Lauren and I had our laptops beside us and we sat up in bed and watched it, right? You know, there are, there's easy uh, ways of being able to reach others um, and, and, and it's much more comfortable perhaps. Um, and it's really easy for followers of Jesus to hit, and this sounds like a plug and it half is, half isn't, but it's really easy for followers of Jesus after they watch, you know, say something on like tough questions or something like that, to hit the share button uh, on a social media platform. And then all of your friends instantly mm -hmm. are able to see, or at least have the opportunity to see that same video or scripture or writing or whatever it might be. It's really changed a lot of ways um, in a digital age that we're able to share information and to share our faith, but it still needs to be genuine. Right. It still needs to be genuine. But the other thing too, is that you're reaching people who maybe wouldn't darken the doors of your church ever. You yeah. know, um, I've heard some comments from some of my family who have watched things online, um, who I don't know have been in church except for a wedding and a funeral, you know, mm -hmm. um, but they want to come and see. You know, they want to um, they want to know what's going on. You know, there, there's an interest there. Um, and so there's that invitation through the online worship that that helps start that conversation. You know? Yeah. Um, and, uh, go ahead. I also was thinking about the fact, you know, our question is, how do we share our faith in conversation? Mm -hmm. um, and again, I really believe that it begins with the relationship. But I also think that people are gifted differently. And so, you know, scriptures tell us that, that some are meant to be apostles, some are meant to be disciples and teachers, some are meant to be evangelists, which is, you know, those who would preach the good news to others. Mm -hmm. Some are meant to be prophets, some are meant to be in leadership roles or in administration or um, the, the gifts that God gives are, are a mass. I mean, there's plenty of gifts to go around. But sometimes I think we put a lot of pressure on ourselves to be evangelists, you know, to to find that way to um, verbalize our faith. Uh, and perhaps that's not our gift. Perhaps our gift is hospitality. And so do we show Christ through that gift of hospitality and in that way, invite people to come and see? You know? Yeah, um, yeah I, that's a really, really important point um, that I, we can't miss over is, you know, I, and I can picture some people and I can hear them saying right now, I don't have the gift of, of being out in front um, saying, you know, uh, come to know Jesus. That's not who I am. But I do have other gifts that right. I'm able to use for God's glory. Um, and I think if they use those gifts as a way of invitation, in a way they are evangelists without, you know, preaching the word, you know. Yes. Um, but it's how we use those gifts and whether we invite people to see Christ in us through our gifts. Yeah, uh, scripture we had chosen for this is from uh, Romans 10, 14, and 15. Uh, and I just want to read that real quick because it really fits in with it is, uh, but how are they to call on one in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in one of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone to proclaim him? And how are they to proclaim him unless they are sent, as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news, right? Uh, regardless of our gifts, we have ways within those gifts to be able to share the good news of, of Jesus Christ. Uh, again, forgive me, um, sermon prep brain has kicked in as well. Uh, so we're in 1 Corinthians 13 uh, this week because we're talking about agape love. And uh, the first couple of scriptures, uh, verses of, of, of 1 Corinthians 13, uh, you know, if we have all the wisdom and knowledge and gifts in the world, but we don't have love, what good are they? Uh, and I really equate that, that love going back to that, uh, you know, self-sacrificing uh, genuineness that, that we're talking about, that if, if we aren't sharing our gifts out of the love that first was given to us by God, 
it's just not going to work. And if it's not shared out of a genuineness, but we're sharing gifts to get something out of it for ourselves, it's just not going to work. Right. And, and to integrity in that process, you know, yeah. people need to see Christ in us and they need to see it at all times. You know, they don't right. want to see that we are, you know, one thing on Sunday and something different on Tuesday. Uh, but the other piece of that is first Corinthians, the end of first Corinthians 12, where Paul lifts all the gifts. He says, you know, not everyone is an apostle, right. you know, and he goes on to, you know, say, let me show you a more excellent way. Yes. And that's yes. chapter 13. Yes. Love. Yeah. You know, so, you know, regardless of what your gifts are, if you don't show love, people aren't going to see Christ in you. And, and I think, you know, with it, we can have the most genuineness, most loving place that we're coming from. And we can feel called sometimes to share the good news with others. And sometimes the answer back is just going to be no, <laughs> right. um, you know, whether it's an invite to a small group or to church or whatever it might be. Sometimes the answer is going to be no from the person that we've reached out to. Um, but we can't I let that discourage the parable us. of the sower from, yes. um, I think it's, I'm, I'm not sure right now, which gospel it's either Matthew or Luke, but you know, I think both of them have a similar parable where um, the sower goes out to sow seeds. You know, and you know this parable, you know, some fall in a good place, some fall around the thorns and the rocks. And uh, the ones that finally fall on the ears that can hear are the ones that will bear fruit. Right. Well, I think about that as those trying to share their faith in conversation. Only 25% of those seeds actually grew healthy fruit or healthy disciples, if you want to use it that way. Stay so, tuned for yeah, more encouraging information. <laughs> yeah, you know, we're going to, you know, even if we find ways to share our faith in conversations, even if we built those relationships and then we share our faith and invite somebody to come to church, you know, we can't be discouraged. We still have to sow those seeds, but we have to recognize the reality that probably only one out of four is going to hear that and let it materialize in their lives so that they become faithful disciples, you know, um, Sounds kind of fatalistic that only one out of four will hear the good news, but I think that's encouraging to for us to continue, you know, and not be defeated when yeah, don't give up. quarters of our words fall on deaf ears. Yeah. Yeah. Don't give up. I think that's one of the key things. You know, we don't, um, we don't want to build relationship with others and get to a place where we're able to start sharing our faith. And the answer comes back as no. And we, we quit seeing the person. We can't right. do that no. uh, because then it wasn't genuine to begin with. It wasn't right. out of love. Right. Um, then it was out of our own agenda. Yes. Yeah. It's just going to be that continual um, by, by living, by using our gifts, whatever they may be. Um, but that continual being in, in communication and, and community with those people, um, I think eventually one way or another. And, and again, with the planting of the seed, sometimes we never know, too, um, how God has worked uh, right. through us or in spite of us even mm -hmm. into that person's life uh, to bear fruit for the kingdom of God. Sometimes we'll, we will never know. Again, you know, stand by for more encouraging news, but we're not doing it for our own self-satisfaction to begin with. Right. Right. We're doing this for the glory of God. Um, and I also we've... think that, you know, you started to say in the beginning of our conversation around faith sharing that, you know, it doesn't work to beat somebody over the head with the Bible. I mean, it doesn't. That, I don't know that that's ever really brought anyone to Christ. Um, but the truth of the matter is that there are some small ways in conversation that we can introduce Christ into the conversation. Like I said, we can say, I'm going to, I'm going to be praying for you about that situation. Right. Um, you can also offer a prayer, you know, people are sometimes surprised when you do that, but it makes a world of difference when they see and hear that you're praying for them. Um, they, then they might want to come and see, whoa, that was, you know, that was pretty awesome that that person prayed for me, um, right. you know, or, you know, why are you so happy? You know, I'm so happy because, you know, I'm content to live the way Christ has called me to live, you know which can open up questions. I don't think we need to have all the answers. I think we offer up an opportunity for people to ask us questions. Yeah, and I think that's a pressure that we often come to it when we talk about sharing our faith is I won't have all the right answers right. or I don't know my Bible enough to be able to answer all the questions that might come up. And 
And I don't necessarily have had the Jehovah Witnesses or another group knock on your door with all of their scriptural promises and you don't know how to respond. Right. You know, because in some ways they're like quoting scripture to you that maybe you've never even heard, you know, um, and you feel inadequate to have a conversation. Um, I think it goes back to how well do you know your scriptures? Yeah. But the, I, I, we can't let that um, be our stumbling block either. Right. To say, I'm not going to share my faith because I don't know enough scripture. Well, I mean, there's really easy ways to remedy that is to start learning more about scripture uh, in a small group or whatever that might be, more time and, and personal devotional time. But I also, think okay, I think it's okay to acknowledge that you don't yes. know things that well. I think yeah. it's that's, you know, that we're all on this journey of discovery to know, to be more Christ like. And we can't come to people as if we have all the answers either. Yeah, and I think that's a really good answer when we're in those discussions and someone is questioning about our faith and we don't know the answer is to say, I don't know that answer, right? To ad admit it, but to also say that's part of the beauty of being a follower of Jesus Christ is I don't have to have all of the answers. I am not perfect and I, I, can, I can live in the fact that I am not perfect, but I serve a perfect redeemer. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and we can do that to say, well, you know, then there's opportunities to study the Bible more and to figure out the answer, to consult, you know, a pastor or a spiritual leader in our lives to be able to say, you know, how do I confront this question or this issue within the Bible? Um, because there's a lot of topics the Bible covers, it turns out. Uh, so there's there's room for a little bit of questions in there. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think we can't let the pressure of um, I don't know all the answers to be our stumbling block to it. Um, I think that's- yeah, Pastors sometimes are guilty of that. Yes. Pastors think they have to have all the answers. And I think it's more um, more true to who we are to say, I don't I don't know the answer to that. You know, um, let me pray about that. Let me, you know, do a little bit more digging. You know, um, let me talk to, let me call a friend, you know? <laughs> um, and I think that we're more, um, more people of integrity when we say we don't know the answers than when we pretend that we do have all the answers. And, and funny part of, of all of it is for these, um, these little videos we're doing, um, my laptop is currently sitting on three books, exegetical books or study of scripture books um, to elevate it that I'm currently working on for the, the week's sermon. Um, yeah, because we don't have all the answers, even those, you know, theologians who have devoted their entire lives, uh, spent in the libraries um, to, to the word of, of God. Um, yeah, we don't have all those answers, but yet um, we're able to, to serve a perfect redeemer uh, in the midst of that. And it is hard sometimes to admit that we don't have the answer. We feel it might be embarrassing to not have the answer, whether we're a pastor or, or a follower of Christ in, in the pew. Um, either way, sometimes it can get challenging for us to say, well, I don't know um, the answer to that. I'm horrible at memorizing scripture, um, but I can, I can pinpoint it enough that I can look it up really easily and remember where it is in scripture to read it. Uh, I'm just not good at memorizing it on the surface to begin with. Um, but I think in, in sharing the faith with others, if we're genuine, if it's out of love, if it's out of using our gifts, uh, people are going to see that for what that is. Um, because we've established the relationships. They know who we are then. They know when we're blowing wind and when we're not. Um, and so they're going to know a little bit easier when we say, you know, I don't know the answer. There isn't the pressure. We're not on, um, we're not being interrogated, essentially, um, that we're going to crack under the pressure of it all, but that we can say, you know, I don't know the answer to that, but I, this is what I do know. Mm -hmm. And this is what I have found comfort in my own life. But it's about having those conversations. Again, when we're talking, the question is in conversation, it's got to be relational. It's got to be the conversation has to take place to begin with. Um, so often we, we look at um, the, these opportunities that we think, wow, that would have been a really good place uh, to say something or to, to do something. And I didn't do it because I was afraid of the pressure around it that wouldn't be perfect. Or that I might is, be rejected for what I said. I mean, there's right. a whole lot of fear that goes into that reluctance. Yeah, we, we don't have to be perfect in it. Uh, and anyone who knows us knows that we aren't perfect to begin mm -hmm. with. Some people even like to remind us that we aren't perfect. <laughs> um, but it doesn't have no. to be because that people already know who we are when we're in conversation relations with them. Which also means that it's not a uh, flash in the pan, one-time event. 
Yes. It means that it takes time to build up to that conversation. You know, Excellent point. Um, yeah. You know, um, and we don't do that with strangers. We do that with people that know us well, which it takes time to build up those relationships. Um, one of my um, pet peeves when I was a district superintendent was how quickly we moved pastors um, because it takes a while to build up trust, to make that relationship uh, one of um, vulnerability and integrity. And when we move pastors after one or two years, um, that trust is not built, you know? And so it's hard then for the faith community to um, accept the next pastor because they didn't build up trust with the previous pastor. Um, and so it's a it's a long longer journey than sometimes what we make of it. Absolutely, um, but again, it it needs to happen. Um, we're a people uh, uh, created for community. We're created to to put trust in one another, to rely on one another. Um, Proverbs continually tell us to sharpen each other like steel on steel, mm -hmm. um, but that we're always in conversation and, and building each other up in the community of faith, but also building each other up to go out and, and share that good news in relational, how it was first told to us. It could have been from a parent or a relation or, or a family member or extended neighbor, but it was given to us and shared with us by someone who already had a connection with us one way or another. Um, and I also think about leading by example, you know, yeah. um, in the, in the letter of James, it says, you know, faith without works is dead. People need to see your works. Yeah. Um, yes, you can say you have faith, but if they don't see your works, what good is that? You know, if somebody's out in the cold and you just say, well, go be well, God be with you, you know, but you don't care for them, like giving them your coat, you know, um, what good is your faith? Um, and I think we forget that, you know, it's more than what we say, it's what we do. And, and, and to that point, and, and this stings a little bit more, is it takes more than a Sunday worship service to do this. Um, if, if we go to church on Sunday morning and that's our church for the week, um, you know, again, that's not coming from a, a relational community built place. Uh, it does take more than that. It takes um, a lot more than that. It takes work as a relationship what we have with God, um, but it also then takes work and, and sharing that good news with others. Uh, we need to be yeah, fed Monday well. through Saturday. Yeah, you know, yeah. Um, people, if you invite them to come and see and they see you in worship and they see that you're all pious and, um, you know, faithful on Sunday mornings, but then on Tuesday, they see you do something, you know, beyond the pale. I can't think of a <laughs> perfect example to use. Um, they're going to see that too. And they're going to say, there's a disconnect here. There's a disconnect. Um, um, you know, what does that say about being a follower of Jesus? Way back when you could go out to eat in restaurants, um, you know, waiters and waitresses said the worst time to be on shift was Sunday morning for lunch um, because you got the church crowd coming in. Right. Uh, and and I've experienced and they're that. they're pushy and they're not patient. And yeah. Exactly. And, and they stand out usually by their dress uh, within uh, the restaurants. I know um, probably two years ago or so now, Lauren and I attended a service on a Saturday night. Uh, I had the week off and I wasn't preaching. So we went to worship. Saturday night, we're actually out shopping mid Sunday morning. And um, this crowd started to come in and we were dressed in jeans and t-shirts. And uh, we got looked upside and down that we were dressed that way and shopping as the heathens that we were on yes, Sunday. We're mornings. not keeping the Sabbath. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it is, it extends beyond Sunday morning, it extends beyond one hour a week uh, because people are watching. And I think, you know, both you and I could give countless examples of people who have come to us, not from congregations, but from community who have seen, you know, the actions, not, puffing ourselves up, but have seen the actions beyond Sunday morning as a person that we can, that they can talk to, that they can bring their problems to, because we know we're going to approach it um, perhaps a little bit differently. And I know we know congregation members, countless congregation members who have experienced the same things of, of that way, because of the way that they live lives doesn't mean you're perfect in living the life outside of church. And I, again, I think that's part of the beauty of relationships is we know that we aren't perfect, um, but others know that, hey, you know, like you said, you seem happier. Um, you seem to be optimistic on things that are going on, or, you know, you're, you're able to offer this insight that I just can't see in the world around me. Um, people are attracted to that. And, and part of the reason 
broken record Adam this morning is genuineness, uh, that it comes from a place that is true. And it's not just for show in that moment. And I think that is so, so important uh, for us. Um, but we got to do something about it. You know, it, it all comes back down to that. Um, you know, it is not, uh, and this is here, a video with two pastors saying this, but it is not the responsibility of the pastor to be the professional Christian that, that uh, reaches out solely in the name of the congregation. Um, it is a, you know, regardless of our gifts, we're able to share the good news of Christ to the world around us. It is not the responsibility of just one individual person it doesn't have to be the pastor necessarily, but it's, it's beyond one person. Right. And folks might come to worship some Sunday morning to meet the pastor and to hear the pastor and to see what he or she has to say. But the reason they'll stay is because of the love of the congregation. Yes. You know, they'll, they'll know that they're loved and they're accepted. Um, uh, yes. Maybe they first came to, you know, come and see, you know, Pastor Adam Miller or Reverend Arling Beecher. But the reason that they'll stay is because they see the love of Christ in the congregation. Absolutely. Well, we really just, uh, these have, these last two went much quicker, it seems, than the first two. I don't know. Maybe, maybe we're, more we're just comfortable. more comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I want to thank you so much uh, for being willing to take time out of your days uh, to do this and to record these. I know uh, technology isn't exactly uh, always work the best or the most comforting things, uh, but I'm so appreciative that you were willing to take the time to do this. Um, I, think, uh, I think these have been great, um, and I'm really excited to see how we can use these um, for just deepening uh, faith journeys and to, uh, again, sharpen each other like steel mm -hmm. and steel um, with it. Uh, uh, any... Thank you, Adam. It's been a great joy to be able to, to share these conversations and to have um, some adult conversation and to share my faith in, 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 this, um, in these opportunities. So thank you. Absolutely. Uh, I'm going to ask if you would close us out with a uh, prayer for this and for our series on uh, tough questions. I'd be happy to. Thanks, Adam. Thanks. A oh, gracious and loving God, we thank you so much for the opportunities that you give us to share our faith. We know, oh Lord, that sometimes that's a difficult journey. We're not sure what to say. We're afraid of so many things, of rejection, of not having all the answers. But we know, oh Lord, that if we live close to you, that you will give us the right words, that you will open our mouths and we will share our faith. Help us, O oh Lord, to be people that are genuine, that are vulnerable, that people that walk in integrity. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would continue to guide us as we, as we seek to bring others to you, that we invite them to come and see and that they see the love of Christ, not only in us, but in those who, who share our lives. We pray, O oh Lord, that we would truly be committed to being more Christ-like on our own faith journey so that others would see Christ through us. We thank you, O oh Lord, for the opportunities of technology to share in this study group together. We thank you for the wisdom that comes in conversations and community, and we thank you that, that you have blessed us with this time. We know, O oh Lord, that in life there are so many tough questions. We wonder where you are. We wonder if you hear our prayers. We wonder, oh Lord, how it is that we live in this day and age and how we respond to people who have authority over us. We wonder how it is that we help others to, to know you. And we pray that you would just continue to guide us as we wrestle with tough questions, as we continue to be faithful, as we struggle to be in community with others, even in the midst of a pandemic. And we just pray, oh Lord, that you would continue to guide us, that we would follow your will and your way that we truly would be people of faith and that others would see Christ in us. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you uh, so much. And You're very um, welcome. if anyone has any questions or any other tough questions that you're uh, struggling with, feel free to comment them in the section below. It uh, doesn't mean we're going to answer them necessarily, but uh, we can definitely connect with you one-on-one -on -one, uh, to reach out and to offer you some, hopefully some direction and some opportunity to grow from that uh, as well. Um, I'm going to go ahead and say it now. I'm thankful that technology has cooperated with us um, and the streaming portion of this to get these recorded. Uh, and I'm just so thankful that uh, we were really able to do this uh, together. So thank you, uh, Arlene. Again, you're very welcome. So, all right. And take care, everyone. And we hope to see you all soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>